the uh, elevator ride version of what Bashar is actually here to convey, what would it be? Basically, the thing that I love about Bashar's information is <clears throat> he takes a lot of metaphysical concepts and he really, no pun intended, brings them down to earth with very pragmatic and practical understandings based on physics as to why they work. And the one that I think is one of the most important things is he talks about what everyone has now been hearing for years. Follow your passion, follow your bliss, act on your highest excitement. The reason why he says that is so critical is because the sensation that we experience as passion, as excitement, as joy, as creativity, as love, that sensation is your body's physical translation of the vibrational frequency of your true natural core being. And so anytime you act on something that contains or expresses or reflects that energy of excitement, that energy of passion, that living your dreams kind of idea, your bliss, you are in alignment with who you truly are. The thing, as he explains it, about excitement is that it is a complete kit. And what he means by that is <clears throat> excitement and acting on it is the driving engine of your life. It's the organizing principle of your life. It's the path of least resistance in your life. It's the thread that leads to all other expressions of your excitement. And it's the reflective mirror that points out to you anything within your belief system that might be out of alignment with your excitement so you can identify it, integrate it, and bring it back into alignment with your excitement. So the formula that he's talking about when he says, yes, act on your highest excitement is fundamentally three parts. Act on your highest excitement to the best of your ability without any insistence or any assumption as to what the outcome of that action ought to be. Following that formula allows you to take advantage of the fact that excitement is a complete kit and that it will bring you synchronistically everything you need at the right place and the right time to allow you to continue to expand your experience of living your excitement and it will support you however you need to be supported but you must use the tool in the way the tool was designed to be used in order to get that effect. People are still in many ways practicing the idea of really acting on your excitement and what that means because a lot of times they will forget parts of the formula, parts of the equation, such as letting go of what the outcome needs to be. And thus they are in this state where they are learning what the physics of that idea of following your bliss is all about and allowing their actions to really use that tool in the most precise way possible. But I can guarantee that when you do, because I've experienced it myself over and over again, it does work, but you have to really use it precisely uh, for it to work. But I like that Bashar is capable of explaining why it works as an energy tool. Um, and I think that's probably one of the most important things that he has to uh, say and has delivered to us. Mm. Hello, Bashar. And you good day. Um, my question is... Speak um, up, speak up. Why is it that when I want to change a bunch of deep-rooted beliefs, I'm always feeling lazy or diverted or not excited enough to start working? Because you have a belief that is diverting you. Because negative beliefs will prevent you from changing them. It's one of the things that beliefs do in general, is they are designed to perpetuate themselves. Negative beliefs will use certain kinds of negative tactics to divert your attention from changing them. That's how they perpetuate themselves. So they will call upon or amplify the beliefs within you that say, this is going to be too tough. This is going to take a long time. This is going to be scarier than I want it to be, etc., etc., etc. And that will suddenly allow you to feel as if you really don't have the energy to do such things. But you have to see through that. You have to understand that that's just a trick and a tool of the negative belief, preventing you from recognizing that the belief is easy to let go. It has to do those kinds of tricks because it really is easy to let go of them and it has to make you think that it's not. Therefore, it will use any tool, any device that it can to trick you into thinking that it's more difficult than it is. And that's the feeling that you get, or at least one of them. Do you understand? Yeah, but if you know that that's just the product of the belief, if you know that's just smoke and mirrors, it's just a trick, it's just a lie, then you can see through it and you can act through it. Because if you really do want to let those beliefs go, 
You can, easily, by just identifying them and seeing how nonsensical they are. But the first thing you have to realize is that they are just beliefs. It's not a fact that you're lazy. It's just something you have been told to believe is true to prevent you from looking at something that is negative that doesn't want you to let it go. You have to see the trick. Once you see the trick, you'll get fired up. You'll realize that you have every opportunity to discover what that belief is and let it go. You just can't fall prey to the trick. You don't understand? Yeah. Is this helping you? Yeah, it makes sense. I know. <laughs> That's how things work. This is another description of the nature and structure of your actual physical personality. That's how the personality is structured. You have to believe the belief is really real in order for you to have a physical experience based on that belief. Now, positive beliefs don't have to, let's say, work that hard because they're telling you things that are true about you. But the negative beliefs are not. That's why negative beliefs have to work so hard and have to trick you and have to lie because the only way to convince you that what they're saying is true is to lie to you over and over again and reinforce it with the idea of emotions and thoughts and behaviors because what they're telling you isn't true. So they have to work harder to convince you. They have to use tricks to convince you. Whereas the positive beliefs can be completely transparent. Make yeah. sense? Yes. So the more you understand how this works and the nature and structure of beliefs, the more you will find it is easy to discover them and let them go because you can see through the illusion. You know that what they're telling you is not a fact. It's just a belief and beliefs can be changed. I'm working uh, on a, a phobia that I'm carrying from last 20 years. Do you think it's a bunch of beliefs um, that are deep rooted or it's something else? Again, listen to the way you're framing that. We understand what you mean when you say beliefs are deep rooted, but the belief wants you to believe it's deep rooted. It's not a fact. It's an illusion that it's deep rooted. You are constantly changing yourself. You are constantly a new person. But when you have bought into the idea of what the negative belief is telling you, then the next person you become recreates the belief to create a sense of continuity and you think you're the same person. You're not. That's an illusion. You can redefine yourself in any way, shape or form you so desire, in any way that you prefer. You do not have to buy into the idea that beliefs are deep rooted. That's what the belief wants you to believe. It's not a fact. There are only five facts in existence. Number one, you exist. Number two, everything is here and now. Number three, the one is the all, the all are the one. Number four, what you put out is what you get back. Number five, everything changes except those five laws or facts. Everything else, everything else is just an opinion, a belief, a perspective, and they can all be changed because they're not facts. They're just conditions and temporary ones at that. Is this making some sense? Yes. So you have to catch yourself when you hear yourself saying things like, well, is it so difficult to let go of these because they're so deep rooted right there. What you're doing is you're creating a spell. Literally, you're creating a formula, an energetic formula that makes it difficult, that makes you believe it's a fact that they're deep rooted. This is false. It's a presentation. It's an illusion. It's an idea. It's a perspective. It's something the negative belief is asking you to buy so that it can perpetuate itself. You just have to learn to understand that and see through it and catch yourself when you say things like that because they're not empirically facts, what you're saying. Mm, yeah. Does that help? Yes, it does. <clears throat> thank you. Well, thank you. Hi, Bashar. I knew you good day. Good day to you too. Um, I have a three years old and um, I a love- A child, this. you are yeah, saying? Yeah, my baby. No, Male, no. female. A boy. Yes. Male. Yes. And um, I've been challenged uh, raising him because um, he has a very uh, because you are still raising yourself. 
Exactly. All right. <laughs> I'm learning a lot. About yes, myself. many of you are children raising children. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah, and uh, it's 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 been a challenge because yes. I go back and forth uh, between what and what. If I'm doing the right thing, if I'm are you doing the best you can? Yes. Do you love the child? I love him. What else can you do? I just want him to. Be what else can you do? besides loving your child and doing the best you can. What else can you do? I guess that's all. <laughs> Is that all right? What was do that? you think you are failing your child? Y yeah, sometimes I feel How? like... By not being... An discipline adult? him. Well, why like, don't you discipline? Why don't you guide? Because uh, sometimes I, I wonder if the is the right thing to do to put him in time out and tell him or let him children be. must be taught the consequences of choices as long as you are certain that the idea of the consequence is something that would bring harm to them then it might be the best way to allow them to understand that there are consequences but you could also explore with the child at whatever stage in whatever way you believe you are capable of communicating this Explore with them, ask them what they think the consequence would be of a particular choice. Let them learn by actually exploring the idea of consequences. Now, you can arrange as the adult, so to speak, you can arrange certain safe environments, interactive environments, that create shall we say, a miniature version, a safer version of the idea that they were attempting to do. To show them on a smaller, safer scale that there will always be a certain kind of consequence to choices and that they can learn what consequences they do and don't prefer on the smaller interactive scale rather than having to experience it on the larger scale which may damage them irreparably. Do you understand? I understand. But you, as the adult, need to be inventive enough to use your imagination to come up with ways of allowing them to experience these things in a safe modality. To teach them the consequences of choices. By interactivity, which is the best way to learn. By actually doing something and seeing what happens. But you can reduce the scale in a safe way. So you can use your imagination to create certain scenarios in which they can learn these things and once they learn them on that level, they will apply them on every other level. Then you will have guided them, quote unquote, disciplined them appropriately. They will discipline themselves once they understand the consequences of choices on a scale that's safe. And then you can teach them how to apply that to larger scales. Yes? Yes, thank you. So, do you mm -hmm. think you have the imagination to do that? Yes, I do. Well, then, <laughs> anything else? To, I'm going to do it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Does that thank help you. you? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. And to you, good day. I just want to say thank you once again. All right. Well, I just want to say you're welcome once again. I know. I wanted to ask you if you could speak, speak, up. speak up about the work of Dolores Cannon. What about it? Just anything you might want to share. If a permission slip works for you, use it. If it doesn't, don't. I understand. Anything you feel is relevant to share about her work or? Only those things that you feel are relevant. It's really in your hands. It's not up to us to endorse. Okay. You understand? If it works for you, use it. If it doesn't, don't. If parts of it work for you, use them. If parts of it don't, don't. It's up to you to decide what parts of things work and what parts don't. It's up to you. It's your permission slip. Or you wouldn't be asking about it. Yes? Right. Well, decide for yourself what's relevant in it and not for you. Basically all of it. All right. For it's now. Relevant. Right. Because well, that may change as you change. Okay. So then segueing from that, I suppose... Can you tell me more about how to help the children and people I'm working with? Without how to help the children on the earth? Um, technically, yes. Help them what? In general. 
all right. In general, you can allow them in their education a few specific things. Number one, find out what excites them and adapt the lessons they need to learn to their excitement, not the other way around. Number two, teach them in a safe environment how to make choices and what the consequences of their choices and actions actually are. Number three, teach them that they are totally self-empowered. They are as powerful as they need to be to have anything they need in life without having to hurt themselves or anyone else in order to get it. Just teach those three lessons and you will have a powerful next generation of children. And of course, remember that the generations of children being born on your planet now are not just new generations. They are actually a new species. Right. And they are not forgetting as much of who they are. So one of the things you can teach the children is how to teach you who you are by listening to the fact that many of them know more than the adults who they are. I understand that also. All right. Um, but at the same time, yes. how can I not get so drained by my work? And I have a feeling you're going to If ask you are me. drained, you're not acting on your excitement. I knew that was coming. How psychic of you. What are you not doing that you would rather be doing? Or if you are doing something that's exciting, maybe you're not doing it in as exciting a way as you could be. Which is it? It may be both. Maybe both. All right. Well, the question again is always, why are you not acting on your highest excitement? What definition, what belief is preventing you from doing so? What are you afraid of? Or, yes. or and or, and or, is there a way that, or is it that my energy is getting drained by other people? Is there a way to protect my energy? Like there is no about? such thing and no such possibility as your energy being drained by other people. Remember, you're the only one in your reality. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so you may be creating the illusion that others are draining it. But all you're doing is saying that those people are representative and standing in for definitions within your own consciousness that are draining your energy. Yes? If you're sending your energy into a negative definition, by definition, you're sending your energy down a black hole. So stop putting your energy into black holes and you won't be drained. Yes? Okay. Um... Remember that you can't actually be drained. You're just creating the illusion that you're being drained. And I'm doing a good job at you it. You are doing an excellent <laughs> job. But why not change jobs if you no longer prefer this one? Okay, and I guess... No, um... no, no, we're not done. <laughs> you can't squirrel your way out of this. No squirming. What prevents you from moving in the direction of what you say you would rather be doing? Is it a definition that to do so, it will be somehow even more draining? Well, yes, perhaps, no, maybe. but also I just don't know if I need to change my perspective of what I'm doing now. Well, of course that might be true, but all you need to do is investigate that to find out. It's very simple. Explore your imagination and say, if what I'm doing actually is representative of my excitement, but I'm the one that's damping it down and making it appear to be not exciting, what definition would I have to have or what could I do differently that would allow it to become more exciting? Is there another way I could do this? Am I preventing myself from doing it in a more exciting way because of what I think of as conventions of society or definitions I've bought into from my parents, my friends? If you explore that and find that there is simply no such thing and that this thing you're doing really is simply not representative of your excitement, then we would suggest that to the best of your ability, at whatever pace you're comfortable, you start doing the thing that is. So that at least you can, in baby steps, if nothing else, prove to yourself that the thing that really excites you can actually eventually support you in life. Yeah, I thought of that a lot, but there really isn't anything else right now. That's so nonsense. Just... That's nonsense. I don't know. I do. <laughs> it's I... absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. You may simply be misinterpreting what we mean by acting on your highest excitement. I mean, as far as work, like work. Yes, work. all right, well, that's what I'm saying. But the thing is, is acting on your highest excitement doesn't have to be expressed in the form of a job or a career or a project. Right, well, I kind of separate it as like 
there's work and then there's outside of work. Well, you see, that's why you're creating the difficulty for yourself. Because as you say, in your society, a labor of love is no labor at all. So if you're doing the thing you love to do, your work and your love will be synonymous and effortless and energizing. Yes? Yes. And you're creating it to be different things instead of allowing it to be the one thing it could be. And I do feel a lot of love at, like, throughout the day at times. With, I understand you feel but... it at times, but we're not talking about the times you feel it, are we? We're talking right. about the times you don't. Yes? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what's the point of the conversation, yes? Mm -hmm. If everything is hunky-dory, get on with your life. But you're saying it's not. So we're not talking about the times that it is. We understand you're capable of creating that effect in your life sometimes, but we're here to talk to you about the times that you're choosing not to, aren't we? Yes, I guess I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm helping to the greatest extent possible, but I guess that's all related to my... You want to help? My... You want to help? Help yourself, right? Thank you. <laughs> because if you're not helping yourself, how can you help anyone else? Right. You help no. others by being the best example of the true you you can be. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you're not helping anyone, no matter how hard you try. All they see in you is the same miserable frequency they see in themselves. <laughs> Misery loves company, yes? So the minute you stop being miserable within yourself, then those that need to see someone in joy to know that it's possible to have that happen in their lives will use you as a shining example. But until such time as you allow yourself to be that, all they will see is a reflection of what they're already experiencing that they don't prefer because that's what you're experiencing at those moments. And that may be taking what's taking so much of the energy because I want Of to course. Don't you understand how much energy it takes to be someone other than yourself? That's what's tiring you out. You are falling into belief systems that say you have to be someone you're not. That's exhausting. Right, because I do technically work for a system and I know that it's, it's all... Well, if you know it, and... act like you know it. Because knowing and action are synonymous. Let me demonstrate. Do you have a small object that you can put in your hand? A coin, a pen, anything? You have it? Yes. Put it on the floor. Have you done it? Yep. Pick it up. Have you done it? Yes. Did you think about doing it? Did you say, well, I think I can pick it up. I wonder if I can pick it up. Do I have a belief system that says I can pick it up? No. You just picked it up. Why? Because you knew you could, and knowing and action are one thing. So when you know something to be true, you just do it. You don't question it. You don't wonder if you can do it. You don't sit there examining your belief system about whether or not it's possible. You just do it. And that's the difference. You actually do what you know is true for you. Yes? yes. So don't say you know it if you're not doing it, because that's just a lie you're telling yourself. <laughs> but when you really know it, you'll do it. Just like you do anything you really know is true for you. Yes? Yes. Does that help? It does. <clears throat> it does. <laughs> it's just, you it's know just, how you, you always just, say it's how... Just, it's just, it's just, let me see if I can find one more excuse and one more reason not to be who I prefer to be. Let me just make sure I haven't exhausted all the excuses I could dredge up to keep myself from being who I prefer to be. At work. What Outside difference does it make? What issue. difference does it make? What difference <laughs> does it make? You're the one making the difference. If you are not enjoying your work, work at something you enjoy. What's working stopping you from working at something you enjoy? What are the definitions, what are the beliefs you have about work you would enjoy that is stopping you from acting on it? It can't support you? What? I just don't know what it is. Sure you do. No, I don't. It's just that you won't know that you do until you get into the state of being first of that joy. Remember when we said you can't perceive what you're not the vibration of first? Yes. You have to be in joy in order to know and be inspired at the things that would be reflective and representative of your joy. 
You can't wait for that thing to show up, just like you can't wait for the reflection to smile before you do. So when you are at work, even though you know you don't prefer it, what you need to do is you need to stop invalidating it and stop invalidating yourself for being there. The idea of choosing what you prefer means that you don't invalidate what you don't prefer. It all has to be equal. Stop putting your work down, making it seem less than, less valuable than what it is you could be doing that you would enjoy more because whatever it is you're doing now has brought you to the point where you realize there's something more you want to do. So take your work by the shoulders, give it a big wet kiss on the lips and say thank you for finally showing me what it is I do prefer for so long showing me what it is I don't prefer. I will do that on Monday, thank you. All right, then you are using what you don't prefer to propel you in the direction of what you do instead of just sitting around moping about what you don't prefer this is and like, not doing anything about changing it. I mean, I wouldn't say it's like gone that far, but okay, I understand. I'm saying it's going that far. <laughs> And you will experience that it's going that far if you stay in a place you don't prefer to be. Long enough, it'll turn on you because it will push you out of the nest in whatever way it has to because that's what you're asking it to do. By not preferring something, you ask it to knock on your door and say, you should move along, you know. By ignoring it, it will knock louder and say, you really need to get going, you know. If you ignore that, it'll pound on your door and say, please, 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 you need to move on. If you ignore that, it'll kick the door in and say, you're fired, get out. <laughs> That's what you do when you refuse to listen to the signals that you're giving yourself that something is what you don't prefer. The longer you ignore it, the longer you hesitate to move in the direction you prefer, the louder it will get the more it will push. Yes, that's how it works. Understand something about the law of attraction. This dovetails perfectly into that understanding. It is not wrong to say, as many people interpret the law of attraction on your planet, to mean, well, yes, of course, you have to be the frequency of the thing you wish to attract. That's fine but it's not a complete nor a deep understanding of how it works. Here is the true secret of the law of attraction. You have a core vibrational frequency. It is purely, uniquely you. It's a beacon, it's like a lighthouse. It shines, it radiates purely that signature frequency of your unique being. It never stops radiating that light, that frequency, that energy, never stops. Everything that is in alignment with that frequency is doing its utmost to come to you. Everything that is not aligned with that frequency is doing its utmost to get as far away from you as it possibly can. If the things that are aligned with that beacon aren't reaching you, it's not because you're not vibrating at the resonance that you need to attract it. It's because your definitions and beliefs are holding it away. If the things that are trying to get away from you can't get away from you, it's not because they're not trying, it's because you're holding on to them. So the true secret of the law of attraction is not how to learn to attract what you prefer, it's how to learn to let go of what you don't so that you can let in what is trying to get to you automatically by definition. That's the true secret, and that's why it's effortless. It's just about letting go and letting in. It's not about having to learn to do something you're not already doing. Make sense? Yes. Does this help? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. A leap of faith, it's really knowing that this is you and getting the reflection that that's true. And what would you say to the guy that, let's say, you know, has a family, several mm -hmm. kids, and he's working a job he doesn't particularly like, 
but he doesn't have a lot of financial buffer and he has to take care of his right. family and he really wants to be a professional musician, you know, but right. he has, hasn't even begun to start to, to move in that direction. I mean, it could be very irresponsible for him to just drop his yes. job and become a musician. Absolutely. And, and my response would be the same as Bashar's response. And that is, as long as you're holding on to a belief system that says that your excitement cannot support you as well as what it is you're already doing, even if it's not what you love to do, you have to honor your belief system because it doesn't serve you to jump off a cliff if you don't believe you have a parachute. <laughs> so by all means, you must hold on to whatever belief system you believe you need to hold on to so that you will feel comfortable and safe and supported. But what Bashar is encouraging us to do is at least you have the ability sometime to start taking action on your excitement to the best of your ability without any insistence on what the outcome ought to look like. And the more you are willing to at least take some steps in that direction, the more you are able to prove to yourself eventually that your excitement can support you. And then at whatever rate you are comfortable changing, you can let go of the things you don't prefer to do and only start doing the things that you do prefer to do and see that those things can support you maybe even better than the things that you didn't prefer to do. But it does not do anyone any good to just jump off that cliff if they don't really believe that there is a pillow down there that they're going to land on. So honor your belief system. Be, be honest with yourself, really honest with yourself about whether you really believe your excitement can support you or not. Hold on to the things that will support you until you know for a fact for yourself that what you're really truly all about is also capable of supporting you, as I said, maybe even better than what it is you're doing now that you don't prefer. But it's got to be a balancing act. Yeah, and, and the transition doesn't have to be abrupt, necessarily. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't to have be, to no. be. Absolutely and, not. And you might actually suck as a musician and just you know, have, have delusions <laughs> of grandeur, you know? And, and... Exactly. <laughs> well, that's, that's where the honesty comes in, because, and that's why you need to drop the expectation about what you think is going to happen, because sometimes the things that excite you don't necessarily excite you because the thing itself has to come to fruition. Sometimes you're lured by your excitement simply because you need to move in that direction, and that's the only carrot that would get you moving. Yeah, maybe something else will unfold. Something else will unfold, and it may look absolutely nothing like the thing that initially lured you in that direction. That's why it's important to be very open about what the end result really needs to be, because the physical mind doesn't really have the capacity to know how something actually needs to happen. Only the higher mind has that ability. Mm -hmm. But the physical mind is designed to experience what's happening now in the present. And if you're open to the idea that the higher mind will bring you exactly what you need in some way, shape, or form, even if it looks nothing like you expected it to look, if you go along with that and align with that, you will see that whatever comes does actually serve you and does actually get you where you need to go even though it might be in a completely unexpected route. But that's the surprise of life, is not to be so rigid that you think you have all the answers about how you're going to get somewhere, and let life show you and let your higher mind show you the truly unexpected and surprising route that you actually will take. I mean, look at myself for an example. If somebody had told me 31 years ago I was going to wind up being a channel and going all around the world and channeling for thousands of people, something that presents itself as an extraterrestrial entity, I would have said they're completely out of their mind. So, but just by following my excitement <clears throat> with no assumption how things were going to turn out, I've had a pretty unusual life and it's brought me some pretty extraordinary experiences that I wouldn't necessarily have had any other way. So you have to really leave yourself open for those surprises because that's the joy of life. That's the delight in life is to find something about yourself that you didn't even think was possible can actually happen. Hello, yeah. Bashar. And you good day. Um, it's an honor to meet you. It really is. And you I'm as well. Nervous, involuntary nervous high school student trying to receive some insights on some profound answers right now. Speak up. Yes. Okay, so I wanted to know about the, the five laws regarding the third one. The one is the all and the all is the one. Does yes. that mean that I am God experiencing myself? Yes. So as an aspect so of God. Everyone single everyone everyone right here is acting autonomously according to my germane to my vibration. Is that correct or you are creating your own version of them in your reality just as they are doing for you. 
Because I'm confused because, you know, like the way the law of attraction works, let's say that there was five people. Yes. And we all focus on the same goal. How do Not we, possible. Not po And how is that so? Because you have your own reality and therefore even though it may seem to be a similar goal, it will actually be slightly different and unique to their reality. Even though you have made an agreement that it appears to be the same, it is not. So does that mean that I'm in this room by myself right now talking to myself? And you are the room. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh my God. Um, do you mean that literally or figuratively? Just, I just need that reassurance to reinforce that notion. Both. both. It is both literal and figurative. So can I take, can I acknowledge it as literal or figurative? Absolutely. We do. Okay, okay. This is what is meant by the holographic structure of existence. All aspects experience themselves as all that is. So the atom itself exists by virtue of force, which is consciousness. Is that correct? So there is only consciousness. There is only consciousness. Oh, that does make a That's lot of sense. That's what existence is. So what happens when I die? Whatever you wish. So do I retain the memories now? Like right now, do, yes. do I remember my ABCs? You my contain everything. Degrees? Nothing ever goes away. Remember, this whole idea that many people on your planet have of blending with God, so to speak, it's not the loss of your identity. You simply wind up realizing that you're the only identity left. So in and the only identity that's ever been. So one of my reasons is that if I was God, I must have gotten bored as omniscient, no, as omnipotent no, being. No, 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 no. Okay, okay, I was wrong, okay. It's not wrong. It's just that boredom is an experience within God, but God does not get bored of experiencing boredom. So within existence or all that is, um, it, it doesn't change as itself, but within itself. Yes. And, uh, okay, so the experience is real, but yes. fundamentally it's not real. The structure never changes, but the experience does. That's how creation expands. So it knows itself from new perspectives. What happens when I experience all that is? Then you will be all that is. Then what can I do from that point? Then you can experience yourself as an all that is within a greater all that is. So there, it's an it's a infinite chain of events. It is. That's beautiful. That really is. It's it just really what it is. is. And yes, it is beautiful. But so, that's what it is. It can't be anything else because that's what it is. That's why the first law is you exist. That which exists can never become anything but existence. It can take many forms of existence, many expressions of existence, many perspectives within itself, but it cannot become non-existent. The reason it cannot become non-existent is because by definition, non-existence doesn't exist. So it only has one, uh, one, uh, one characteristic to not exist. That is its only fundamental characteristic is that it exists. So we cannot perceive non-existent. That would be impossible from your logic. Is that correct? It would be impossible to perceive non-existence. Yes. Because by definition, it doesn't exist. Oh, wow. So I was thinking that a pitch black room would be non-existence, but the fact that you're aware that you're in a pitch black room means that that's an experience that you're in a pitch black room, which is a concept within all that is. Yes, and therefore it's part of existence. Oh, God. I mean, when you say all that is, you literally mean all that is. All that is. There is no outside. So right now, there's a version of me right there with like, eight heads right now, if I can imagine. In some reality, yes, where that is relevant. Jesus, wow, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the name of that being is Jesus Wow, we don't know. <laughs> so when I die, anything that I conceive of, can I materialize it instantaneously? You already have. I already have. All it. things exist at once. You just shift your point of view to something else speaking, that's already going on. From this space-time linear perspective. Yes, I know it seems that way to you and will appear as if you're shifting to another reality after this one, but it's going on right now. I so all see. you're doing is shifting your intention, shifting your focus, shifting your consciousness to something else that's already happening simultaneously. You were right about this correlating with, you know, like you were saying that this is all simple physics. Yes. And it really does correspond with quantum physics exactly yes. all yes. possibilities do in fact indeed exist absolutely in some reality it, that is true yes um you I, can't imagine non-existence so just to get a clear understanding if there was 
a, 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 another version of me right now, but with just like one hair gone, you know, one hair pulled out, that would be a totally there different There is Joshua. a parallel reality identical to yours in every single way except one subatomic particle. One subatomic particle. And yes. Okay. Okay. And on 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 until you also reach realities that are nothing like yours at all. So I'm afraid right now that linearly, li linearly speaking, when I die, yes. what, okay, so if I wanted to experience where I had wings or I was some type of dragon or turtle, I don't know anything, just I can conceive of any experience, uh, so to speak, will that happen instantaneously or will it be like this? It depends on what level you're creating that projection from. How do if I decide If you're creating that? it from a timeless level, like a higher spirit realm, you'll experience it instantaneously. If you're creating it from a realm that still has some degree of need or relevance for the concept of time and space, there will be a little bit of a process involved. It depends on what level you choose to experience it in. And will I be aware of the peripheral options of the gradations that I can choose? Depends on what level you're experiencing that from, yes, of course. If you're experiencing it from a level to which it's germane to know about all those other levels, then that's the way you will experience it, yes. So Anything you can imagine on some level is experienceable. Experienceable. That, that, okay. Does that help? That helps a lot. Thank you so much, Rashar. I appreciate it. All right. Thank well, we you. appreciate you. Into conscious realization. The particular piece of music that is the appropriate vibration to allow you to be in the proper state to attract whatever information or whatever situations or whatever people or whatever opportunities you require dealing with the ideas of health issues and also dealing with the issues of letting go, forgiving the self, letting go of regret, letting go of grief, letting go of all those things that allow you to lower your vibration in that way to forgive yourself to free yourself to be more whole. The specific piece of music is the first three minutes of Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 7, Movement 2. Play that while you're in a peaceful state of repose. Let it wash through you. Those chords are exactly, precisely what will tap into the idea of letting go of the past, letting go of sorrow, letting go of grief, letting go of regret, and forgiving yourself, and moving toward the vibration that will attract to you whatever information is germane to allow you to be in the healthy state that is your birthright. By raising our frequencies, we're creating kind of a leading edge uh, of a wave. Um, and, and by raising our frequencies, uh, you know, it's about not being in your ego, passion, it's following your passion. Letting go of fear. Mm -hmm. Um, all the things that lower our frequency. So fear equals go. negative, bad frequency. Well, I